What an absolutely incredible start to our day. That was the Dancing Daves from Dance Syndrome. Let's give them another round of applause. They were incredible. So now it's time for our first speaker of the day. Please join me in welcoming to the stage author of Mind the Inclusion Gap and trustee for the Women's Sport Trust, Susie Levy. It was planned and it was totally unstructured and it was everything I needed to start my morning. I've decided that's gonna be the new alarm on my phone. <laughs> um, my name is Susie Levy. I've got you for a limited time, but this morning we're talking about how you get people engaged. What you do to bring the people who didn't come to the conference. You already drank the Kool-Aid. You already believe in inclusion or you wouldn't be here. So how do you activate all the individuals who could be allies, who could be agents of change? Jamie contacted me <laughs> through Tess Howard, who many of you will have met yesterday around inclusive sportswear, because I just wrote a book about that. And I wrote the book, Mind the Inclusion Gap, because I found neighbors and friends, colleagues would look at me and say, Susie, you're so brave talking about these things, racial inclusion, disability inclusion, mental health. And I remember thinking, it's not brave, it's goddamn essential. It's essential. We live in a world that is diverse beyond belief. It's endless. And inclusion is for us to figure out. But how can be, people be inclusive if they don't know what it is? I'm going to share five quick lessons that I learned on my path to inclusion that I hope will help you as you engage your friends, your allies, the leaders in your organizations, and other agents of change. The first lesson, out is not one moment in time. This might seem like a silly lesson, but I thought out was kind of the moment you told your parents, mom, dad, I'm gay, I'm lesbian, I'm bisexual, I'm transgender. That couldn't be further from the truth. Out is the moment, it's every moment in the future you choose to be yourself. It's the ability to assess, assess a situation and go, am I gonna be okay? Am I gonna physically be okay? Am I gonna be psychologically okay? Is this situation all right for me? And to understand that out is every moment in the future, you need to know that it's illegal to be gay in 80 countries in the world, punishable by death in 10. Last year, in the first three months of the year, there were 239 new laws in the United States of America put forward with anti-LGBT legislation. That number has tripled in the first quarter of this year. We live in a world where it's not safe to be yourself, so you have to choose, you have to decide, can I be me? So why is this important? I, th I thought I was really inclusive. I thought I was welcoming people to my teams. When I learned this lesson in 2009, I'd already staffed 50 teams, and I thought I was being a good person, an inclusive person. I'd never done a single thing to signal it was okay to be yourself, to shortcut that, to make it easier for someone to choose. Because until you choose to be yourself, you're editing. We're all editing. White men are editing. Individuals with a disability are editing. Women edit. In a man's world, absolutely. It's not, it's not men's fault, but this world we're in was created for men by men in a time when women were not valued. We're changing that, but you have to understand the amount of time and energy that it goes in. If you're not part of the power or the norm, if we're, if we're talking about editing to be closer to whiteness, to making my hair look a little less African, to taking my religion and hiding it, because I don't want anyone to judge me for it, I don't want to lose a job, to changing my name, because let's face it, we call it name bias, but it's it's just racism, you are much less likely to be answered on a CV, it brought to an interview, if your name doesn't sound white. In every country in the world, there are studies that prove this. I didn't realize that, everybody's editing. So my friend, my friend Rob said to me, Susie, well yes, of course we're editing. Now Rob's gay, and he's like, I've got this list of those who know and those who don't know, and it's not because I'm hiding that I'm gay, but it's not always relevant in the first moment. 
So I'm like, like hi, I'm gay Rob. I'm like, ooh, too much information. It's a bit like, hi, I'm divorced Susie, and you're like, oh, there she goes with her American self, right? Like, whoa, we're just getting to know you. So you're managing this list of who knows and who doesn't know, because you don't want it to be the first thing, but you don't want it to be the last thing either. And editing takes time and energy. And everyone is editing to a different extent. I want it, when you're teaching about inclusion, understand what it takes, the energy, the effort, the bits of you that you give away as you edit is really important. Which brings me to my third question. What do trusted relationships require? I'm not going to answer this, by the way, you are. What do trusted relationships require? Safety, what else? Honesty, what else? Communication, respect. Anything else in a trusted relationship? Communication, honesty, vulnerability. I think you can't have trust without authenticity and vulnerability. Now, if you were coached to get on this world, my suggestion is you were probably coached on two things. You got to work hard and you got to know somebody. Because <laughs> the knowing somebody matters, let's face it, knowing somebody matters. But what happens to the knowing somebody and the trust in a relationship if one party is coming to the table editing? Are they authentic? Can you edit and be authentic? Is it possible? It's possible, but it's not probable. The more you edit, the less likely you are seen to be authentic. The less likely you allow yourself into those vulnerable spaces. And when it comes to relationships, it's two-way. There's this concept called minimizing contact where we live in a diverse world, we have many diverse interactions, we come to a summit like this and it's awesomely diverse, but by the time we get back to our dinner table, it looks a lot like us. Minimizing con contact is when your dinner table looks like you, the place where you are most vulnerable. And it really comes into play in race, in my experience. The thing is, men kind of have to have women at their dinner table at some point. <laughs> There's a lot of us. And women kind of have to have men at our dinner table. But when you ask yourself, how many individuals at my dinner table are black? How many individuals at my dinner table are Pakistani? How many individuals at my dinner table are gay or transgender or gender non-binary? It's really hard to behave authentically if you don't have trusted relationships where you break bread with people in that group. It's very hard. So you've got one group who's editing for safety, trying to be like the norm. Whichever, whichever diversity category we're talking about. And you've got another group, because of their lack of comfort, are probably editing too. So what just happened to that relationship? It's not as strong, it's not as meaningful, it's not as authentic, it's not as intimate as it could be. We make decisions about human beings based on relationships. We have to invest it and understand why inclusion and inclusion skills are fundamental to good relationships. That was my third lesson I learned. My fourth is, I don't see color as well-meaning, but way off. Now, whether we're talking I don't see color in the racial sense, like I don't see your beautiful brown skin, I don't see your ethnic heritage, your language, or I don't see your wheelchair, if we're talking about I don't see color in a disability sense. My friend Sophie's like, yeah, I don't need you to define me by my wheelchair, but I need you to see the three steps to the bathroom, because I'm not getting there on my own. What are we going to do about it? If you don't see color, can you see racism? If you don't see gayness, can you see homophobia or transphobia? The thing is, we do not need to define people by their diversity categories. That is not what, it's not the all of them, it's not the limiting factor of them. But we have to understand the beauty and the joy that comes with blackness, with ethnic heritage, with racial background, with your disability, and the challenge that comes with it. We need people to see it all. And these allies who aren't sure what to do, 
many of them I made are using this. I don't see color. Because what are they trying to say in that statement? What does I don't see color if we take it in its goodness? Some people would argue it's very lazy and it's not good. But if we're just saying it's a good, it has good intentions, what are they trying to say? All people are equal. That's what they're trying to say. But we're not all equal. <laughs> this world is totally unfair. <laughs> we gotta have a reality check. I would like it to be more equal. I would like to change the unfairness of this world, but I can't change it if I can't name it. And if you want to activate the individuals in your organizations, in your networks, and you want to create change, you need them to see color in the racial sense and in the widest sense of the word. Which brings me to my last two lessons, which are pretty fundamental. Being nice is not the same thing as being inclusive. Why is that true? I spent most of my childhood as the nice one, the one stopping arguments. My parents had quite a messy relationship. And everything I did was I wanted us all to get along. The thing about niceness is often we avoid conflict. We can see everything from everybody's side. I can see both sides. But what's the limiting factor of niceness? When you conflate being nice and being inclusive, what do you give away? I did this for almost two decades, by the way. This is me. What do you think I gave away by leaning on my niceness and not understanding what inclusion was? I gave away my voice. I gave away my freedoms. I opted not to challenge. I stepped back from situations that I thought might maybe harm me. I didn't champion other people in the same way. And actually, in my niceness, I didn't see color. I didn't see lots of things. I also didn't see women who were struggling because I wasn't struggling. I was like, well, that's their story. I'm stronger than them. Yeah. Right? So we, even when we're in a group, understanding that our lived experience is not the same. And a nice person kind of goes, well, the world is nice. We'll all figure this out. And you're like, no, the world is not always nice. And the world is incredibly messy because humans are messy. And we got to jump in with both feet to that mess. But if you want to help individuals in your organizations be active, you got to help them move beyond nice. So I had a client who kept telling me, Susie, we're so nice, we're so nice. I'm like, you're so white. Like, I'm just going to put that out there. You're very nice and you're all white, and you're mostly male. That's not a pro that, um, that is not an accusation of being white men, by the way, but it just was a truth, right? I gotta point it out. So I built this scale for them. This is almost a decade ago. And I was like, all right, where does nice fit on my spectrum? Where do you think nice fits on my spectrum? Where would you place it? Neutral, where else? Ignorant, where else? Apathetic. You might be totally nice and be an absolute sexist, by the way. You're just not nice to women, or those women. I think nice is irrelevant. It took me a while to place this. I built it because I was trying to figure out how to help them. Now, my two red ends share something in common. What do they share in common? Action. They're doing absolutely doing words. What's the middle? Not doing. Passive words, right? And part of the secret to inclusion is we got to move more people up the spectrum. I don't want to move people down the spectrum. And by the way, I'm not changing any way in the, anyone in the bottom red. I don't even ever try to change anyone in the bottom red. It's not worth your time or your energy. But where do you think most of the world sits on my spectrum? In the red ends? No, they sit in the middle but they have a false sense. This sense of niceness allows them to believe they're an ally. This was my final, this is why I wrote the book. I was like, there's no such thing as a passive ally. You cannot call yourself an ally. You cannot love traveling the world, the diversity that comes with traveling the world, all of those things, and then go, but I'm not sure about racial integration. Back here at home, and you're like, what? <laughs> Oh, as a friend of mine said to me, as I was taking some heat for the book, she was like, you didn't write a cookbook. I didn't write a cookbook. 
There is no such thing as a passive ally, and individuals who see themselves as an ally but do nothing hurt the cause. But you cannot do what you don't understand. So, I wrote this book, feel free to buy it. Uh, not because, not because I want to sell you a book. In order to create the kind of change we need in the world, we need more people who have knowledge, really clear factual grounding. We need more people who hear the lived experience of others and understand it's not the same as their lived experience. And we need more people who take action. This book is a call to action. Stop being a passive non-ally and jump on board. I used this analogy last night. I was on BBC Radio Manchester with Stacey Copeland, another amazing athlete. And she was like, what's one thing you want people to take away? And I was like, well, Stacey, if we were talking sport, I want more people on the pitch. Because right now, we got a lot of people standing at the sidelines going, it's not my bag. I'm going to let that fight happen over here. And so I encourage you, all of you who care, who give a damn, who are here, who you, as I say, we say in America, you've drunk the Kool-Aid, bring a friend on the journey. Tell them, ask them, help them understand what you need, what others need, and move them beyond passive. Thanks for your time today, and I will be on the panel. I think Jamie's coming to introduce everyone else.